Welcome to another session of our Becoming series. This is where we come together to learn about careers in energy efficiency. Each month, we're meeting a different leader in the sector to hear the story of how they got started, what kind of skills are most important for their role, and to tell you any advice that they have for people who are looking to follow in their footsteps. I would love to hear in the chat what it is that brought you here today or what it is that you're hoping to learn. I know for myself, so my degree was actually in global development. And so I'm really interested in learning more about international work and how Wesley got into uh, Canadian environmental advocacy. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat um, and mention some, something you're hoping to learn or what it is that brought you here today. And I'd love to hear that. Just so everyone knows, we are recording tonight's event. So if you miss anything, if there's any information you wanna double check, um, you will be able to go back and review that. And we're starting today at five and we have a hard cutoff at 5.45 Eastern. So uh, if you have anything else that you've got to get to tonight, just know we are gonna have a hard stop time at, at 5.45. If you have questions throughout the presentation, at any point, feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Or when we have our Q&A session at the end of the presentation, you can raise your hand and I can call on you to unmute yourself and ask your question directly. If you put questions in the chat, I will try to catch them, but know that the best place to put them is the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And so to introduce you, this week's speaker is Wesley Normington. Wesley is the Executive Director of Relay Education and has worked in the Canadian charitable sector for 15 years. Wesley began his career in the nonprofit sector as a program manager in disaster relief. And since 2011, Wesley has worked with a dedicated team to launch Relay Education as a leader in renewable energy education across Canada, and recently into the United States. And so Wesley, the floor is yours to tell your story. Thanks very much, Kirsten. Uh, welcome everybody, thanks so much for joining. I'm really excited to be here for a number of reasons. Who doesn't like talking about themselves for 20 minutes? Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, but also because the work that Relay does, uh, we, we are always, uh, trying to help young people get started, um, not just in the nonprofit sector, but in environmental careers across the board. But of course, nonprofit um, industries are a part of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And, and as I'll mention later afterwards, um, if anyone wants to reach out to myself or others at Relay for more advice, uh, please do. Um, so as Kirsten mentioned, um, I'm the executive director of Relay Education, and I have been since 2015. And I'll talk later a little bit more about what Relay does. Um, but maybe I'll just start by talking about nonprofit director and sort of what that means. Um, because it's, I think this talk is a little different than perhaps some of the other ones Efficiency Canada was doing, whereas the nonprofit sector is obviously a very large catch all term. Um, you can be a physician, you can be an accountant, you can be a teacher, you can be a project manager, you can be virtually any profession and be doing it within what we call the nonprofit sector. And I mean, just so we're all on the same page, essentially that means uh, you're working for an organization or a charity that does not uh, uh, keep profits. All the uh, money that is, that is brought in goes back to the programming and the great work that the organizations do. Um, so it's really, a, a it, it can be so many different careers, so many different professions. Obviously today we're gonna to touch on a number of those related to the energy sector and, and specifically what, what Relay does within that and within uh, efficiency. Um, but I wanted to just sort of give, firstly give the, the sort of overview of, of how I got here and sort of my path and my journey. Obviously everyone's is very unique and different. Um, but uh, to start off, just talk about why I'm in the nonprofit sector. Um, I think for me personally, I knew early on um, that I wanted to be in a career where I could do something that I believe in, where I could do something that I felt was making an impact. That might be a bit cliche, uh, but it is, it is true. I just ultimately know what motivates me. And I think by doing something that you are motivated by, ultimately you will have some level of success. You will be able to, and, and, and success can mean a lot of different things. But for me, it's being able to make a, a decent living, doing something that I believe in, that I'm excited to do every day, getting to work with great people and hopefully building a better future uh, for my kids and for generations to come. And so I, as I mentioned, I had my own unique journey and, and I think unique path 
to, to get to where I am today. And so I think that's kind of where I'll start is just sort of giving that firsthand account of, of, of what has, has sort of brought me here. And, um, and, and, and I think it is helpful and important, not just for me to sort of talk about my experiences, but I, I do think that our, our work experience, of course, and, and our life experience are major factors in terms of the direction of career that one takes and, and sort of how successful they can be within that. Um, so for me, I, I went to the University of Western Ontario and I got a degree in political science. And over the course of getting that degree, I had various ideas of what I wanted to do with my life. And it seemed to change every six months. I was gonna be a police officer, a lawyer, I was gonna join the foreign service. And then ultimately at the end of uh, the four years of my undergrad degree, I still virtually had no idea. Um, I, again, I knew I wanted to do something that I believed in and that I was interested in and passionate about, but what that was exactly, I wasn't hundred percent sure. So, what I did was I moved to Japan. I became an English teacher. Um, I just kind of had the travel bug, I guess you could say, as a lot of folks might do after finishing university or college. And I lived outside Tokyo and taught um, youth and adults English for about a year and a half. Um, so I, education is still a part of sort of what I do but at that time it was just um, some great life experience and I, I guess what I got from it was obviously being immersed in a different culture and 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 learning to be more independent and learning Japanese a little bit it 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 at least put this sense in me that I wanted to do something that I was interested in and I was able to get a sense of doing something a bit different and that did appeal to me uh, but to be honest I still really wasn't sure ultimately what that would look like. Um, so I came back to Canada and moved to Toronto. That's where the jobs are and were at the time, um, a few years ago, many years ago now. And um, again, wanted to start to explore the different opportunities that were out there um, that were involved in, in projects and, and organizations that I could make a positive impact. Um, so at that time, I didn't have a ton of experience. I had been teaching English for a bit, but other than that, I wasn't, unfortunately, the type of student in university who was very involved in volunteering or, 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 or doing a lot of extracurriculars. And looking back, I guess you could say, if I had regrets, that might be one of them, because I'm gonna touch on that a little bit later in terms of the value that, that volunteering and and, and other sort of involvements can, can benefit you from pursuing a career. Um, but I hadn't done much of that. So basically I had a little bit of sales experience from a summer job and that led me to an organization called Youth Assisting Youth, I have the, the logo up there. Um, great organization, it's kind of like big brothers and big sisters. They have young people mentoring other young people in the city of Toronto. And my role was volunteer recruitment. So basically I had a Bristol board and a sign-up sheet and I pounded the pavement and went to every high school and college in the greater Toronto area, um, talking to youth who wanted to volunteer to help younger people uh, by spending quality time with them and, and being mentors. Um, so I got to learn the city very, very quickly. Um, I got to meet others from organizations, like-minded organizations and other NGOs very quickly. It was, it was a very sort of accelerated experience in terms of immersing myself in a, in a place that I hadn't lived before and within a sector that I hadn't worked in before. But looking back on that time, it really, uh, uh, and this is something that's going to be sort of a constant thread, I think, throughout, is that when you're working in the nonprofit sector, there may be... Um, some resources um, or things uh, that, that might normally assist you, say, in, a, in the uh, for-profit sector that may not be at your disposal. And by that, I just mean if you have objectives to complete, you have a program to, to, that has deliverables that you want to meet, um, whatever it may be, um, you need to have a certain level of problem solving and independence and drive in order to meet those deliverables because it, you, you can't always rely on say fancy marketing techniques if you're trying to recruit volunteers. So 
I was pretty self-reliant on just getting out there, getting outside of my comfort zone. I'm sort of naturally an, an introvert. And so going to all these schools and meeting people face to face wasn't uh, something that necessarily naturally appealed to me. Um, but I guess I just had this sense that this is the way to, to, to help this organization and, and do my job was to get out there and be face to face as much as possible with, with uh, some of the students in the schools. Also during my time with that organization, again, I mentioned I'm the volunteer recruiter there. Um, however, and this is another constant thread that I'll touch on uh, throughout, this, throughout this talk is that when you're working for a small to medium nonprofit, there will always be a value um, if you are working as a team. And by that, there's, that can mean a lot of different things, but specifically, looking for opportunities and ways to help um, the organization that may not be within your specific duties and responsibilities. And now that may seem sort of unfair, but I always looked at it as an opportunity, as, as this chance to build my experience, to build my resume and, and not just be sort of solely focused on, say in this case, volunteer recruitment. So when I was going to different companies to talk about volunteer opportunities, um, I would, then sort of naturally sometimes be able to lead the conversation to funding and sponsorship and donation. And so I started to gain this experience in terms of obtaining funding and, and sort of high, high level partnerships for the organization, which wasn't my role, but I always, I, I, it was an experience that really sort of taught me the value in, in essentially keeping your eyes open and, and thinking outside the box and trying to be able to help the organization in, in many different ways. Um, so I was at Youth, youth Assisting Youth, um, and however, since coming back from Japan, I still had that travel bug. I was still interested in international development um, and in working beyond the borders of Canada. And that led me to what I think is probably the most formative sort of decision and that I made was uh, I started to look at volunteer opportunities. And I think that's where the nonprofit sector has, I mean, you always have unpaid internships, I guess, are an op, are, are options sometimes in the for-profit sector, but volunteering um, is such an incredible way to be able to gain experience. And I don't think that this is um, revolutionary um, and people have probably heard this many times before, but um, I know that I, I wouldn't be, I guess, where I am today and, and still doing what I'm doing if I hadn't um, gone out and, and started volunteering and, and offering my time for, for organizations. Um, and that started for me with the Heart and Stroke Foundation in York Region. There was a, a youth committee opportunity basically to help um, them at the time uh, recruit more young people to be involved with the organization's activities. And I had no experience on a board or a committee or anything like that at that time, but I took the opportunity and took the chance. And uh, it was a, it was, it was a, um, a situation where I had to learn quickly in terms of being able to be helpful. Um, but it very soon became apparent that I was learning a lot and gaining some great experience that I otherwise wouldn't have, of course. Um, so I was, I was wearing youth, this is youth, doing the uh, volunteering with heart, heart and Stroke. But again, I was still interested in international development and international issues. And that led me to Global Medic. Uh, so uh, myself and a coworker at Youth, this is youth, actually, we both we're interested in the same thing. And Global Medic is a, uh, an organization based in Toronto that focuses on uh, disaster relief. And at that time was, was mainly focused on water purification uh, programs and um, uh, emergency medical services post-disaster. So after a hurricane, after an earthquake, those types of things. And they had volunteer opportunities. So I was able to, to um, just go to the warehouse and start packing and helping them move uh, things to, to these countries when they needed to send water purification tablets or whatever it may be, there was these opportunities to help out. And that led to um, volunteering on a mission to Indonesia. So at that time, I was still uh, a, a volunteer, but was able to travel and go help deliver a water purification program during floods um, in Jakarta um, back in, uh, I guess, 2006, 2007. Continued to volunteer, and that eventually led to a position opening at that organization, and I was able to go come on full time as an employee. 
Um, so again, that probably never would have happened if I didn't take the time to volunteer. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it was meeting the people, meeting the right people um, at the organization, of course, um, and just building that network and, and, and then being able to, to take advantage of an opportunity when it came up. So I'll touch on that, uh, that experience a little bit uh, shortly thereafter or in a, in a moment. But uh, so I, I worked at Global Medic for about three years and then kind of needed to come back and, and stay a bit more central and work for journalists for, for human rights, which is media development. And at that time, uh, mainly in Africa. So still focused on international development. But while I was at Global Medic, I'm just sharing some, some photos from some of the, the, uh, the missions that were in Bangladesh and Pakistan um, were obviously very, very heart wrenching. Uh, they were always you know, very stressful. Um, but, but one thing that sort of kept coming up as we were going on these missions and helping people after these disasters occurred was the effect that climate change was happening, was having, sorry, um, on these countries. And by that, I mean, climate change exasperating the conditions for extreme weather events. And so a lot of these floods or these hurricanes or, the, or these typhoons were, were sort of record breaking most of the time. So every, every time we respond to a new uh, disaster, it would be recorded as the worst in 100 years or the worst in recorded history for that region. And I was interested in climate change and, and concerned about it up to that point. But seeing the effects of it firsthand in such a visceral, real way was, was really altering for myself and, and very, I guess, distressing. And so somewhere along the way, um, I made a, a, I guess, a decision, or I really felt like I wanted to be involved in mitigating this. This is something that's happening now. It's not something that's happening in 50 or 100 years. And I want to put my efforts into whatever I can do in order to be a part of the solution to this crisis. Um, and around the same time, uh, my first child was born, and that really just drove home the weight of the future and what the future can hold and what kind of world she was gonna grow up in. So it just kind of all coalesced at that point to me wanting to, to really get involved in, in renewable energy um, is obviously one of the key elements to solving the climate crisis. And so as I started to look around to making a, a switch, um, there was, uh, so Relay Education is the name of the organization, but at that time it was called Trek Education. It's part of the Toronto Renewable Energy Cooperative sort of family. Um, and the opportunity to be um, the fundraiser for that organization came up. So during my time, just to back up a little bit with Global Medic, and as I mentioned with Youth Assisting Youth, I had these opportunities to fundraise because when you work for a small and medium sized charity. Um, fundraising is kind of everybody's job to some, to some degree, to some extent, you're always involved in that. And obviously those, that is a necessary function of keeping an organization going and giving it life. So um, I was able to leverage that fundraising experience, which wasn't solely my job, say at Global Medic, but into um, becoming a, a development coordinator at that time for Trek Education and focused on bringing in funding for the organization. Um, so that's just a picture of the wind shear turbine there. So it was a great opportunity to, um, I guess, leverage the experience and the abilities that I had into a sector I wanted to work in. And, and, and I guess that's how I went about it. Because for one thing, I came to that sort of realization later in life that this is what I wanted to do. If in university, I knew that's what I wanted to do, I probably would have taken certain programs or post-grad, you know, focused on perhaps fundraising, pro pro program management, or whatever field perhaps any individual is very interested in. Obviously, there's a pathway that is, I guess, more direct and involves perhaps more education. Um, but for me, it took a little bit longer and it was sort of the result of taking these uh, different opportunities that, that came along. Um, 
So just a little bit on Relay Education. So Relay is a national charity. As I mentioned, we, we, we started in Toronto. Um, and so if you go back about six, seven years ago, we were really um, focused on the GTA. And what we do is we have facilitators go into schools to teach kids about renewable energy, the science of renewable energy, and the uh, careers that are associated uh, with not just renewable energy, but sort of sustainability and environmentally, environmentalism in general. Um, so again, at the time, it was a great opportunity for me. I thought this is wonderful. I can leverage what I know and, 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 and I think some of my skills to helping this organization grow. And um, at this time, uh, a few years later now, uh, we have programs from coast to coast to coast. So we're in Nova Scotia to, to BC and up to Nunavut, we've delivered programs and we've tried to grow out the programs um, to, to fit that as well. The, the programming that Relay Education does, I really see as a piece of the puzzle that is necessary for a sustainable future. Um, obviously for many decades, we've been relying on fossil fuels in many ways, but obviously we need to change that. And part of that is a cultural shift that's necessary. We need to have everybody on board and understand the benefits, the possibilities, and what we, we need to do and what we can do, and to have that the populace and the, the, the voting public as well um, educated and engaged on the sustainable solutions that we have to solve the climate crisis and air pollution and water pollution and all those things. And so that's really at the core of, of what I think the impact of relay education is. And we do that with our classroom programs and, as I mentioned, our career programs. And we work with a lot of indigenous communities that are doing some great things, building solar projects and wind projects across the country as well. Um, I'll just kind of quickly go through a number of these slides. Again, these are just some examples of the work that Relay is doing. Um, and then there's just this uh, very long slide, just uh, basically just trying to drive home the thought process that there is in regards to how educational programs can lead to 100% renewable energy future, how it can lead to a healthy and prosperous planet. So, um, you know, we've gone through the different uh, steps and um, evaluations to, to really come to that understanding. And it's based on um, research that has been done uh, in, in, in the sense of, of, of showing the connection between education and having a more environmentally engaged public um, so be it for renewable energy or energy efficiency, um, education can be a key component to really having, making that, that shift occur. Um, and, and, and so Relay focuses a lot of its classroom programs through the lens of STEM, so science, tech, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, we, we deliver a lot of STEM programs and that gives kids the opportunity to design and build their own solar car, design and build their own wind turbine. So it's very, um, it's very memorable and fun and interactive and hopefully really builds their interest and engagement. As I mentioned, we work with a lot of First Nations communities. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time on what Relay does. I think we do tons of great work and I do encourage you to look us up and reach out to us uh, if you're interested in learning more. Um, but again, just sort of focusing on, I guess, uh, sort of working within the, within the sector. I touched on this a little bit, but um, one of the wonderful things about working for a say a small to medium large small to medium NGO or, or, or charity, if you will, in my experience, again, is the the multitude of hats you can wear, the experience you can gain, the, the fact that you can sort of be involved in all aspects of the organization if it's structured that way. And that's sort of, I believe, how relay operates is giving people opportunities to get involved in, in so many different facets of the organization. If there's something that they are interested in and they, they gravitate towards, then for the most part, we will support that. And we want people to be able to do the things that they're passionate about, because why else would you be working in the nonprofit sector, which of course, you know, tends to have perhaps a lower um, pay scale than the for-profit sector. You can make a great living in the nonprofit sector, don't get me wrong, but there's obviously a disparity there. So it's very important to be able to allow people to follow their passions and, and get gain different experiences in different ways. Um, and so I think that's sort of what helped that those experiences helped lead me to be able to be 
I guess an executive director and, and because there's so many different elements that my job consists of from day to day, fundraising, as I have this in their project management, the admin side, the human resources, being a spokesperson, all those things are really necessary for a great executive director, I believe. Um, there's different ways that, it, and this isn't to say this is how it works for everyone. Some are very much solely focused perhaps on fundraising or being a spokesperson. But again, this is my experience from a say, small to medium sized organization. And it really tends to be involved in different things um, in different aspects of the organization. So I just wanted to quickly pose these questions to yourself for those of you who might be considering the nonprofit sector. Again, there's so many different professions and ways that one can get involved um, in organizations that, that do great work and, do, and have a great impact. Um, but I think for me, these are questions that you might wanna ask yourself. Do you like a challenge? And of course, any job can be challenging, profit, non-for-profit. But I do think that there's probably some added challenges when it comes to working in the nonprofit sector um, to, to really, you know, be it fundraising or be it getting people to um, support your programs, partner with you, whatever it may be. There can be an added level of, of challenge to uh, um, creating something that that you believe is is going to make a positive impact and that and that people are going to need and want, but to making sure that that lines up with the right um, beneficiaries and getting the funding can can be can be difficult. Um, I do think there's great variety over pre predictability. Um, obviously, other jobs again in the for-profit sector can be like that, but when it comes to um, smaller organizations there is a lot of different things you can do and be involved in from day to day. And don't, I don't think you necessarily get perhaps in the situation where you feel like a, a cog in the machine, if you will, or, or sort of just part of a, a larger thing and, and solely focused on your own little area. There's such an opportunity to do many different things. And um, I mentioned initiative there. If you do feel like you're able to take initiative and really um, say, solve problems that come up as opposed to sort of having others do them for you, I do think is an important element when it comes to nonprofit sector. Again, because you might not have the resources that are traditionally there in a, in a, in a corporate world. Um, and it, it a lot of the times requires you to do things that may be outside of your duties and responsibilities typically. Um, but again, I do think that leads to opportunity and, and interesting experiences. These are just some of the soft skills that I think have benefited myself and others that I know in the sector. Again, initiative, problem solving, self-reliance. And I, that sounds like it's not a very um, communal effort, but it is the opposite because everybody's supporting everyone, um, very much so in our organization anyway. But it does require initiative to help your, your uh, fellow colleague because they might be struggling with something. What they're struggling with might not be your duty or responsibility, but taking the initiative to help them is very important, especially this is all heightened during COVID-19 and, and our team has been so amazing at helping each other and getting the job done uh, over the last year. Um, if you like managing projects, and again, being a team player, it's very much a, a, a team uh, uh, setting uh, for what I've experienced with the organizations I've been with, and ability to adapt, uh, again, because you're you're, you know, when you're a small to medium organization it can be very grant reliant. And what I mean by that is large sums of funding can make a very big difference in terms of what the organization is focused on from one day to the next, from one week to the next, one year to the next. And so there can be an element of needing to adapt and to roll with it and, um, and to um, be willing to sort of take on a new challenge. Again, my pathway here is maybe not that traditional, uh, wasn't steeped in a significant, you know, in, in super relevant or specific education and training. Um, but I, again, fundraising and sales experience will only help you in the non-for-profit sector, not, not for profit sector um, because everyone needs to really at, at most times be representing the organization in some capacity. Um, managing projects of any of any sort can obviously be helpful. And again, just to repeat it, uh, volunteering um, is obviously a, a, a great way that is 
typically available to, to get that experience and that. And also just a sense of, is this the sector? Is this the um, type of job? Is this the profession that I'm truly going to enjoy day to day? Um, can really obviously only be discovered once you've done it. And so volunteering does offer at least a taste of that to some extent. Um, and again, putting yourself out there, networking, which I haven't talked about specifically, but obviously um, because there are these volunteer opportunities or there's events, you know, organ charities or, or not-for-profits will hold um, events that people can attend or they might have specific events for networking. Um, there's obviously a lot of opportunities out there to meeting folks and, and, uh, and just um, connecting with, with people who can either give you a chance or, or connect you with somebody who might. And then internships are something that obviously is, is there just like in the for-profit sector as well. So that's all I had. Um, again, the contact information's there. Feel free to also contact myself if you like. It's Wesley at RelayEducation.com. But if you contact the organization, you can talk with myself or any others. Awesome. Thanks, Wesley. So thank you for the great presentation. I, I think that um, a lot of what you said, I think, echoes also for Efficiency Canada. So really similar um, experiences over here. And I really loved your advice about doing a little bit of everything and being willing to step outside of that fixed role. Um, I know it can be really tempting to stay within your job description, but you learn so much more, you're gonna help the team a lot more and you'll advance faster if you can take on those extra responsibilities. I think that was great advice. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, now is your chance to ask questions. We've got almost 15 minutes, so lots of time for that. And uh, so I, I know a few people have mentioned in the chat, they're interested in getting involved in the nonprofit sector. They're interested in some of these opportunities. So Wesley is a great resource. If you have any questions, now is your time to ask them. So. We have one here so far from Daisy asking, what company did you work for in Japan when you were teaching? Great question. Yeah, I had the logo up there, but I forgot to name it specifically. So it's called Nova. Um, full, full disclosure, it wasn't difficult at that time to get a job there. They're pretty much hiring for lots of different positions across the country. I think there's been a bit of a change and restructuring over the last few years with that company. I don't think it's as large as it once was. But so this is going back to the mid 2000s for me. Um, it was there was a lot of opportunities for basically, to be honest, I think the qualifications were if you had an undergrad degree, you would probably get a job if you wanted it. Again, that could be different now. Um, but they were called Nova. There could be. I know there's a Jet program for uh, that's that's sort of uh, run by the Canadian government, I believe, um, that offers. Um, more traditional teaching roles because with Nova it was conversational school, so it was um, not an actual elementary school. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and we do have some questions that were submitted ahead of time, so I'll go to some of those. How have you seen the nonprofit sector evolve and change as um, climate change has become more important or more of a focus? Yeah, that's a well, that's a great question. Um, obviously, over the last 10 to 15 years, and I guess in my experience, um, there's been much more attention on climate change, which is not surprising and obviously welcome and needed. I believe there is, should be much, much more attention than there is at this time. Um, but I guess maybe one way to look at it is the funding side of things. I think there, there is a lot more funding available, be it from governmental or go government uh, funding, be it sponsorship from the corporate sector, uh, which is something you, you want to be very mindful of and and uh, thoughtful of in terms of how you arrange a sponsorship, for example, in terms of you know who you may accept money from. Um, but there definitely is more opportunities out there for programs that address environmentalism as a whole, but also ones recognizing the the uh, importance of addressing climate change. And so I think from a funding perspective, there's there's been a shift over the last 10 years. Um, I think there's obviously a number of organizations. And, um, there's been a, a number of organizations we've worked with across the country that are local, but are doing this, have the sort of um, ethos of, of act local, think global, and um, or act locally, think globally, um, in terms of trying to address the, the 
carbon emissions in their municipality or, or just taking those steps uh, towards mitigating climate change at the local level that perhaps in years past would have been more focused on perhaps land conservation or, or water pollution and, and not to say those things aren't obviously also vitally important. Um, but I do think across the board there is more programming and attention and, and understanding that it's a, a vital issue. And then I guess for us also working with schools and communities, you know, teachers are really receptive to our programs. They understand for the most part, I, th I think that it's something that is, that is important to address now and that students need to be aware of now and that youth need to be aware of um, for a variety of reasons, not solely because that there's careers um, to, be, to be involved in, but um, that it's just something that the you know, kids can go home and talk to their parents about as well. And I guess just lastly on that, there's definitely been a, a big increase in the amount of programming and funding for folks interested in environmental careers. Um, there's some great organizations out there. We do our bit um, in terms of connecting youth with those opportunities and um, trying to educate them on what those opportunities look like. Uh, but there's Iron and Earth out in Alberta that's doing great work and Eco Canada. And there's just a, a number of them that are, there's really that understanding that there's opportunities when it comes, you know, it is obviously something that's scary and we need to address as a society, but there are employment opportunities related to mitigating climate change and obviously with Efficiency Canada as well. And it's, um, yeah, it, I, I think that's, there's been a huge shift there when it comes to preparing folks for environmental careers. Awesome. Yeah, I think in, in summary, lots of opportunities, lots of funding, lots of positions, and that's that's super good to hear. Um, so we have a question here from Kevin asking, can you speak to the different expectations and requirements for short term and ad hoc project based volunteering versus longer term roles such as, such as with a board or as a committee member? So what what can you expect? What kind of requirements? Are you looking great, for? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so obviously short term volunteering could be anything. It could be helping at an event, helping to sort of load and unload the trucks for a, a festival. Um, it could be something a bit more involved, where, like for us, helping facilitate a workshop. Um, it can still be a bit longer term, but I think obviously the ultimate difference is the short term opportunities are are nice and, and, and organizations need that help and support. But in terms of experience and probably what the volunteer is going to get out of it is limited to what that, it's, it's gonna be very most likely like one activity, one you're gonna be helping with sort of one thing. Joining a committee, I think is, you know, if you can, it can, you know, there's obviously an application process and. And a committee is sort of one way to get involved before perhaps going to the board level. Obviously, the benefit there is, is numerous, but I think one of it is you really get that snapshot and a better understanding of how the organization works, what's important to the organization, how a better understanding of how you could help or, or apply your skills to that type of organization. And then on top of that, of course, you're getting this experience of decision making and real influence on an organization what it's like to to assume a leadership role in, in some capacity within an organization um and so i i i think board experience is is terrific again for me just you know it was just a, it was a little committee but it uh it definitely helped me understand just the inner workings of of how an organization works like oh you you meet once a month and you, you make these decisions and like just things that I didn't really know before. Um, and then obviously the connections you can make. So, you, you know, you join a committee perhaps for a big fundraising event. There's probably some high up influential folks who are also on that committee. Um, and so I think, and you're going to, it's going to be longer engagement and relationship with those individuals to get to know them. So there's some great opportunities through that as well. Awesome. Yeah, I am going to turn to a question from the chat now. So Nicole is asking, what advice would you give to students who are in their undergrad who are looking to work in the non -for, not for profit sector? So are there certain opportunities you think they should be applying for or volunteering for that might prepare them for a career in this sector? So I mean, again, the nonprofit sector can obviously mean a 
variety of 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 section of sectors and industries and types of professions. But in a general, I guess, sense, obviously, excuse me. Um, I think I, I guess maybe just thinking, reflecting on our own organization. Um, there are a number of organizations out there that offer paid in that are, offer paid internships. Excuse me. And so, you know, not every situation is like this, but say the federal government provides funding for a paid internship and that is administered by another organization. It's enticing for obviously the organization who to bring on that intern. It's enticing for the, the younger person to be able to get paid um, to and, and essentially be hired at that time for a short period of time. But I do mention it because just from our experience at Relay, we've we've had a, you know a number of paid interns and people take advantage of these paid internship programs over the last few years, and they've stayed on to work full time for us and continue to do today. And so I, it's been a terrific pipeline for us for, for finding great people and obviously you want to be able to pay people um, for their work. So I would, I mean, specific to the environmental sector, um, there's organizations like Eco Canada and I know the Electricity Human Resource Council recently had um, opportunities through that as well. Um, and in a Relay, we try to share that information as much as we can in terms of the specific opportunities that are out there. Um, so I'd say that's one, probably the best thing to look at, summer internships perhaps that are paid. Um, again, just, you know, if there are those committee options and other volunteer options. Um, but I would be, I guess my only uh, point of caution is to make sure that the, the volunteer opportunity you do is something that is going to help you career-wise. So not necessarily just volunteering for anything um, that comes your way or that you're able to do, but making a, a strategic concerted decision and effort of the opportunity that is there is going to help you build your experience and, the, and you lead you on the path that you want to follow, or at least give you that that sense of what that job is like. And then maybe, so maybe you do volunteer for a couple of months, but you realize this, this sort of world or this type of organization isn't for me. Um, and I think that's still time well spent uh, ultimately. Um, yeah, I think hopefully that makes sense and is helpful. Awesome. Yeah, it was a big question. I think that was a great answer. So we do, we have one other question from Daisy, but Daisy, I'm gonna actually encourage you to reach out to Wesley with that one. So she's looking for tips on how to receive sponsorships for NGOs, but I think that's more of a, a skill learning question. So I think that um, Wesley would probably be more than happy to give you some advice on that um, after the call. I'm gonna give you one last question. We've got about two minutes left. So kind of a, a rapid fire one, but what skills or experiences, whether on your team specifically or, or with your experience in the sector in general, do you look for when you're hiring for management positions or when you're looking to promote? So what makes someone stand out for those higher level roles? That's a, it's a great question. Might be a bit hard to answer in two minutes, but I guess uh, my, obviously there's a number of things you want in a manager and, 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 and part of that is a certain temperament in terms of being able to to manage people and be a team leader um, and, and be both an inspirational, both in the way you connect and engage, but also as a leading by example. And by leading ex by example, I mean showing up and, and, and working hard and taking initiative. As I mentioned, the problem solving aspect that I mentioned for me personally, I think is something that I do look for. Maybe that's not just the, the most direct or, or traditional skill in, in, or uh, experience. Um, somebody just showing that they can solve problems without you know, always um, running it up the ladder, if you will, um, is huge. And it's, but when we're all so busy and we have so much going on, people recognizing that they have the capacity capability to deal with an issue um, or at least 90% of it is, is huge. Um, and especially in the nonprofit sector because things, things shift and change and, and it uh, can be very different uh, in a short period of time. And uh, knowing that you have people who can roll with it, who don't get too stressed by change, I guess would also be, and I guess that's what I mean by the temperament, uh, being able to roll with it. 
obviously we all have our <laughs> breaking points, especially during the pandemic, but I, I think those are sort of the soft skills, if you will, that I look for, for sure. Awesome, thank you. So we're at 546, so I'm gonna cut off the questions for now. Um, and so I wanna take some time. Wesley, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, for sharing your story. And thank you for the whole Relay team for taking this chance to do this crossover event with us. And also for all the work that you do to develop the next generation of green leaders. We're all lucky to have you doing the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank um, you very much, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. And for everyone who joined us today, thank you for your time, for your attention. Um, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me, to Wesley, to anyone on our, either of our teams by email, or you can find us on LinkedIn as well. And be sure to join us next month. We're going to have another Becoming event with Matt Gustafson to learn how to become an HVAC technician. So good night, everyone. If you're here in Ontario with me, get out and enjoy what's left of the, the sunshine today and uh, hope to see everyone uh, at our next event.